Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Robert Chandler, clinical psychologist and also the director of corporates and workplace services here at the Lighthouse. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you for taking some time out of your schedules to discuss this very important topic that is men's mental health. And of course, we're in the month of November, which is traditionally Men's Mental Health Month, uh, the movement of Movember that some of you will be familiar with as well. So as I say, very pleased that so many of you, and I can see some really good numbers coming in now, which is great to see. Uh, so, so pleased that so many of you have taken some time out to be here with all of you today, uh, with me, sorry, today. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, something like that. And we'll have the opportunity for some questions and answers towards the end. Please do pop your questions in the chat box and I will take those towards the back end of the session. But uh, let's not delay and let's dive in. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Lighthouse Arabia, we are a community mental health and wellness clinic based in central Dubai. We've got a range of services. We're actually closer to about 40 clinicians nowadays, which is which is excellent. Um, and we have many, many resources for the community. You can see our website or our uh, social media channels to find out a bit more about what we do uh, and the work and the services we have available. So let us dive in then. And let's think about what we're going to get out of the session today. I want to just have a look at the prevalence of mental health issues globally, because I think it's important context. We're then going to take a deep dive and look at the unique challenges that men face in our societies. I will say from the outset, this is not to take away or detract from the issues and the challenges that face women in our society as well. But all of you who have joined today, you will be here because potentially you have male colleagues or you have a man in your life or you yourself are a man who is concerned about your mental health. And it's really important that we have an understanding of the unique challenges that men do indeed face. We'll then take a look at the most common mental health difficulties that do impact men, namely anxiety and depression, before we think about how to safeguard mental health generally, but also more specifically some things that men can be doing to safeguard their own mental health and well-being. Okay, so some general context setting to begin with. We know that around one in four of us are currently experiencing a mental health difficulty here in the GCC region. It's, it's a sort of one in five, one in six from the latest data. So we know that mental health conditions are prevalent throughout societies. We know that mental health conditions don't discriminate based on our IQ, our age, our gender, etc. We will specifically take a look today at those conditions that more greatly impact men, of course, and some of the risk factors for that. But we know that depression is absolutely prevalent in, in the world. We know that it is the second most commonly diagnosed uh, condition, and that's across both physical and mental health conditions. We, of course, saw during the pandemic, uh, well, I don't think it was necessarily uh, a just the pandemic, but I think the pandemic really shone a spotlight on mental health issues globally. Um, and we, of course, did see rates of mental health difficulties increase during that period. Um, but I think many more of us are talking about mental health, which is a wonderful thing. But of course, it is not just the talking that's important, it's then important to think about what we do with that um, and how we access support, et cetera, which I will talk about a little later on today. I'm not going to spend any time today or right now, actually, just on this suicide statistic, because we will take a more uh, detailed look at this as we go through today. But bottom line for you to take from this slide, mental health conditions are all around us. Often we may not be aware that people are struggling in terms of their mental health, but we can very confidently say from the research data that people indeed are. So a slightly then deeper dive into men's mental health. And you will see some statistics and some figures on the screen in front of you that you may find uh, alarming or perhaps that you didn't know. And I mean, let me start with a with a sort of a quick story. I was at a social function, you know, a couple of months ago now and um, chatting to somebody there and telling them a bit about what I did for work. And, and the person said, oh, you know, my, my husband just doesn't feel any emotion. He, he's emotionless. There are no emotions in there. And actually, I'm struggling to get to the emotions within him. And that's not the first time that I've heard a story like that. And 
the thought always going through my mind, and although I'm not necessarily saying this to the other person, but the thought going through my mind is actually there's a very good chance that your husband does experience emotion. Your husband may not have great emotional intelligence. He may not have a great self-awareness of what emotions he is experiencing. He may not have the language to describe his emotional states. He may not have the skills and the tools to be able to discuss his emotions with you. He may feel scared and afraid that if he does discuss those emotions, that's going to change your perception of him as an individual. But I can guarantee you that your husband does experience emotion. If those emotions may not be communicated and shown in the sort of traditionally socially appropriate ways, but he will indeed have emotions within there, as all human beings do. But what do men tend to do with their emotions? And we come on to this a little later on. But I think broadly what happens, and I'm making some, uh, some generalizations here, but these generalizations are in fact backed up in the research. If a woman, if a lady is struggling with her emotional state, typically what she will do is connect with either the social group around her, maybe she'll connect with a family member, she will be much more likely to seek professional support, she will be much more likely to talk and share in order to alleviate that difficulty. What do men typically do? Men typically internalize their emotions. They keep their emotions within. This is why men are four times more likely to be abusing substances. Okay, so men are much more likely, if they are struggling, they're struggling at work, they're struggling in their private life, they are much more likely to numb those emotions rather than to share and soothe those emotions in a much healthier way. You could argue that violence or aggression in men is, is um, more tolerated than it is in women as well. And we know things like, you know, men are much more likely, 11 times more likely to spend time in jail. There are, of course, a, a range of complex factors which predict this. But we do know that men are much more likely to either internalize their emotion or to project their emotion through things like aggression. OK, and not use those sort of traditional or more societally acceptable ways of managing emotions, such as connecting with those around us. We know that men have lower access to social networks. And even if we do have a good social network as a man, it's not typical that we would be talking about things like emotions. Um, we're much more likely to be catching up on, you know, family life in general or sport or whatever it may be, work achievements, which we'll come on to in a moment. But we can see from these statistics that mental health difficulties do impact men. They, they really do. And this is a key takeaway uh, to take from this talk. We know that men don't access support in the same way. And actually, there's a bit of a movement, particularly in my home country in the UK right now, of trying to set up services, mental health services, a little differently for men. Because recognising that sitting on a sofa in front of a professional and talking for many hours uh, may not be the most productive or effective way to actually help men. Uh, and there's a big drive uh, at the moment in this, but we can see particularly in the UK, you know, just over a third of people who access talking therapies on the National Health Service, just above a third of those are men. Yet we do know that nearly four in every five suicides that are completed are completed by men. This is a very sobering statistic. We know that anxiety and depression is much more likely to be diagnosed in women, um, but we know that men are often suffering with depression silently. And we'll come on to why this is in a second. But if this statistic that four in every five completed suicides um, are men, if this statistic doesn't tell us that men are struggling, I don't know what does. And again, super pleased that you've all taken some time to really skill up today uh, on this topic. Um, so moving on then and thinking about the unique challenges and some of you coming into today's talk will have your own ideas. Maybe you've read some stuff, maybe you've spoken to men, maybe you are a man um, who is struggling currently and you will think or have thought about why this is the case. Men's lives, as with women, are governed by gender role expectations. 
as a man born into this world and I have I have, have some credibility uh, in the world of being a man but we are given and we are told certain messages from a very young age about what it means to be a man what our roles are in society what we should do and for many men and if we boil it down and reduce it we could argue that the measure of manhood is in fact productivity what are we able to produce in our lives whether that's producing a family whether that's producing a high income whether that's producing a great job title whether that's you know producing a role in society where people look up to us okay productivity is often the measure of a man in our societies and whether we are sort of consciously aware or unconsciously aware of this this is often what is projected into very young boys from a very young age and for those of you who may be parents and have children then perhaps just doing a quick self-reflective exercise and thinking you know how how do i speak to my you know to my child who is a boy um if he has a sister do i do I unconsciously treat him any differently because of his gender? And it may be that you do, and maybe, again, not necessarily consciously, but these are the stories and the narratives that have been around for many, many, many millennia. We know as well with men that competition um, is key. Again, whether we like to admit it or not, but many men that I meet with and consult with there is this underlying fear that we just don't measure up. And so what we can often see is, you know, a very extroverted or gregarious man who, you know, dresses well and has the watches and has the cars, but actually deep inside, there is still a sense I might not quite be. And then we see things like keeping up with the Joneses, social comparison. But often when men are very honest with themselves and do that deep introspective exercise, there will inevitably be a part of them, as with most of us, that asks that question, am I good enough? We also know that men are silenced by the collective culture when it comes to expressing their emotions or their mental health difficulties. I was... Uh, with a friend not too long ago, and I myself, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have never experienced a mental health difficulty. But of course, like anybody, I go through periods in my life which may be a bit, a bit rough or struggling a bit. And I remember having a conversation with this friend, and sort of I opened up the conversation about uh, this, this slightly tricky period. And almost within seconds, the response was, "Ah, oh, it's fine, mate. You know, don't worry. You know, keep your chin up. This kind of thing." Okay, and often. When a man does take an interpersonal risk, be that with his friends, be that with his spouse, or be that with his uh, mother or whoever else it may be, that conversation can quite often be shut down. And again, I hear this from men that I meet with. If I share genuinely how I'm feeling to my partner, that's going to be really uncontaining for her. She doesn't see me in that role of being vulnerable. I can't be vulnerable. I'm the provider. I'm the person that's meant to keep this family unit together. And so men then, we can see those statistics we saw earlier. We can see how these can easily be borne out. Because if I don't feel that I'm able to share and to talk, and there's nobody being receptive to my struggle, I'm going to start internalizing that, internalizing it and just keeping it in. Finally, then on this slide, you see the final point here, men are alienated from themselves and therefore turn their rage inwards. What does this mean? I, this essentially means that as a man, I've got to know what it is that I'm experiencing. You will have seen on one of the earlier slides that men generally report lower levels of life satisfaction than women do. But in order to say, hmm, actually, I'm not too happy. I, I'm feeling I'm feeling a bit cynical. I'm feeling a bit disconnected. I'm feeling a bit fatigued and low on energy. I've got to really turn inwards and do that reflection exercise. And actually, many men, because we weren't taught from an early age to examine our feelings closely, actually, we're not too sure what it is that we may be experiencing ourselves. We just know that it doesn't feel very comfortable. We just know that it feels a bit boring. We just know that it you know, doesn't feel good. 
And then in order to sort of medicate those feelings, we may turn to substances or, or other addictive behaviours in order to sort of alleviate those uncomfortable feelings. Okay. On the right of the screen then you see, and this again is a very open generalisation, but as men, our jobs, as we're told from quite a young age, have a family, produce to the best of your ability, be the holder or the rock or the protector of the family and assert yourself societally with power and dominance. That creates a lot of pressure for men as well as a significant amount of suffering, which indeed is supported by some of the statistics that I showed you earlier. I will of course say that some societies look different. Okay? Many families look different. Some of these roles will not become, or will not be quite so explicit in some families and systems. These are generalizations, but I'm sure many of you watching this will be able to resonate with some of what you are seeing. These are the key messages that men or boys will typically receive from a very young age. I'm not going to read all of them out verbatim in the interest of time, but I will just draw attention to a couple of them that I very commonly hear in the consulting room. What's even the point in talking if I'm struggling? What's it going to achieve? And this relates to the point that I mentioned earlier about services and mental health services sometimes being set up in a way that actually is conducive to women accessing those services, where we can talk very openly about what it is uh, that is going on and try and find some ways to alleviate that suffering. But men will often say, particularly if they are what we call sort of left brain or task orientated or solution uh, orientated men, will say, well, what's the point in coming to meet with a professional and sat opposite them? I don't want to dwell in self-pity. I don't want to uh, make myself feel even worse. And so often there is no perceived value in accessing psychological support by men. You see some of the other comments here, though. I don't want to burden anyone. Again, going back to that protector archetype. I'm the man I'm meant to protect. People don't want to see me vulnerable. They're not ready to handle me vulnerable. Um, and of course, you know, the second from bottom point here, just to draw your attention to that as well, you know, if, if men are approaching other men, um, you know, you, you just need a drink. Let's just go out for a coffee and we'll, we'll, we'll have a couple of drinks and, and we'll sort it out. This is a very common thing that we hear as well. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit of an overview of the main challenges that indeed do face men in our society. So what does it then mean to have a mental health condition? And again, we've zoomed into men, we're just going to zoom back out for some greater context. What is mental health more generally? Mental health is something that we all have. Okay? Um, I would describe mental health as the, the health of our mind, our thoughts, our emotions or feelings. And I would also add to this the health of our behaviours as well. These okay? so are the things that we're doing. Many of us have seen over recent years that mental health is not fixed. It's on a continuum. It's flexible and it's changing. If I got you to just do a quick self-reflection exercise and ask yourself 12 months ago, how was my mental health on this day 12 months ago? There's a very good chance it's in a different place to where it is today. Okay? So our mental health does flex and change based on what is happening to us in our environment. Mental health is not something that only crazy and weak people have. And actually, when men are accessing support for the first time, this is often one of their greatest concerns. There's something defective. There's something wrong with me. There's something bad about me. Why can't I handle this? I'm crazy. I'm weak. And these kind of messages, we need to dispel these because we know that under the right circumstances, anybody can experience a mental health difficulty. And so it's super important that we are breaking or dispelling this myth. I think it's also a common misconception that mental health only exists sort of between our ears. OK, we said mental health is the health of our mind for sure, but also how we're engaging with society, how we're showing up to work, whether we're engaging in our hobbies, whether we're spending time with our children or relatives. Okay, So mental health goes much bigger than just what is happening inside our minds. And possibly the most or one of the biggest myths, I would say, when it comes to defining mental health 
Good mental health is not about feeling great all of the time. We see the toxic positivity movement on Instagram and social media that says, you know, if we feel bored or we feel cynical or we feel disconnected, this is a bad thing. And actually, I want to say to you, you know, if somebody very close to you dies, you should feel sadness. You should feel emptiness. Those are proportionate emotions to be experiencing in relation to what is happening to you. Paradoxically, it is it is good mental health to experience some of these uncomfortable emotions, depending on what is happening to you. It is not necessarily good if those emotions persist for a great period of time and they start impacting your day-to-day -day functioning. But, you know, if I got made redundant today, I'm going to feel angry. I'm going to feel bitter. I'm going to feel, you know, shame, perhaps. Those are proportionate emotions to be experiencing. Okay, It's when they persist um, uh, that it becomes problematic and challenging. So let's dispel this myth. Good mental health is not about feeling great all of the time. And I've said already that it's not fixed. Defining mental health more generally, the World Health Organization, I've kind of covered some of this, but... Uh, a state of well-being where people can realize their potential, where they can be resilient and cope with what is happening to them. Coping, though, does involve naming and acknowledging the emotion that is coming up in us. And often this is where men get stuck in the first instance. I will meet, you know, many, many men, not just sort of professionally, but also in my personal life, who something bad happens and they will switch straight into solution focus mode what can we do about it okay that's happened what can we do about it you've just got to keep on keeping on okay the world doesn't stop turning and often particularly for um uh women who have very good emotional intelligence those kind of responses can often feel quite frustrating because we want the men in our lives to be able to acknowledge the emotions that are happening acknowledging the emotions does not mean wallowing in self-pity but it is the prerequisite to being resilient moving forward. In order to know what to do with my sadness, I first got a name that I'm feeling sad. I've got to give space and time and attention to feeling that emotion before I move into soothing it and then potentially problem solving it. The World Mental Health, uh, sorry, the World Health Organization also talks about this idea of working product. Good mental health is about being able to work or contribute in a way uh, that serves the greater good, um, as well as potentially the family unit. So I want you to think of mental health on this spectrum. At one end, good mental health, poorer mental health, and then we have mental health illnesses and conditions. All of us, whether or not we've experienced a mental health problem in the past, all of us will have good or poorer mental health from time to time, depending what, on what is happening. It's a bit like physical health. It's the same idea. Many of us are generally healthy, but then we may get, I don't know, a headache or, you know, uh, an infection or something like that. And we slide down the scale. It's exactly the same with mental health. Not everybody experiences a mental health difficulty. So take away from this slide, your mental health, if you are a man, if you're a woman, whoever you are, your mental health is somewhere on this continuum. We're going to do a bit of a deeper dive into anxiety and depression in a moment and, and look at those um, uh, to think, yeah, I suppose because those are the conditions that greatly impact men. But broadly, when we're thinking about mental health difficulties, and there are many mental health difficulties, but the things that they all have in common, we will see persistent and consistent changes in the way this person is thinking, feeling, and subsequently interacting behaving with the outside world. And those changes in thought processes and emotional states will be impacting life. And often people have the concern if they come to somebody like me as a mental health professional, that we're just going to uh, slap on a diagnosis. And actually that's not the case. We need to see the symptoms present, but those symptoms uh, sort of need to be impacting day-to-day -day functioning for us to diagnose somebody with a mental health difficulty. And again, if you are a man watching this or you're a, a lady and, and you've got a man in your team or your, your life, your personal life, and you suspect that there may be some mental health difficulty, you will start to see some impact on day-to-day -day functioning 
whether it's arriving for work late, whether it's unable to spend as much time with the children, whether it's uh, sort of becoming reclusive or isolating oneself. So the impact of those thought processes in the emotional state will start to impact uh, life more generally. I mentioned very briefly earlier, but I do want to pick up on this point. Mental health difficulties are not always visible. We often talk about people wearing the mask of mental health. And going back to some of the slides I shared earlier, it's quite understandable why. If I'm feeling sad, numb, empty, depressed inside, I don't necessarily want the outside world to see that. I don't want my boss to know that I'm struggling because I'm worried how it's going to impact my promotion. I don't want my wife to see that because it would be deeply uncontaining for her. I don't want my parents to know because I may feel in some way that I've disappointed them or that I'm going to worry them and make them anxious. And so not just men, but many of us become experts in wearing masks when it comes to our mental health. So what I'm just asking you to do is to not make assumptions just because somebody is turning up to work um, and they're appearing fine and happy and jovial doesn't necessarily mean that they're not struggling with depression or even suicidal thoughts. Again, it's quite possible to have something like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and still appear deeply uh, and committedly organized to the outside world. So we must not make assumptions about how people are doing purely based on their behavior. Um, if you spend enough time with a man, and for those of you, probably all of you today are joining us because you are in the corporate workplace, um, check in with people on your teams, even those that are performing well and doing well and seem highly organized. Check in with these guys. Make an effort to get to know them in a bit more of a 3D way. Because if we do know them in more of a 3D way, we're more likely to be able to identify if they are going through a period of struggle because the signs are often um, very, very subtle and nuanced that somebody may be struggling. Okay. Um, so making an effort to get to know those, and I'll talk more about this a little later on today, but just really trying to make the point for you that never take somebody's behavior uh, at, at face value when it comes to it. So let us have a closer look at depression and anxiety. Many of you will be familiar with these uh, terms, so we're just going to do a bit of a whistle-stop tour here, but I also want to make the point about how these conditions present in women more specifically. So at the root of depression is the emotion of sadness. Okay, now sadness is a common human emotion. Everybody watching this webinar today, and I'm delighted, I've just looked up at the numbers, we're in the many hundreds, which is wonderful to see. Uh, sadness is a very common human emotion. Every single one of you today will have experienced sadness, as have I. We know what that emotion looks like. But it is a temporary emotion, okay? It comes up in relation to an event or a situation. You know, it could be a meeting or a project or the news of something having gone wrong. And it will, it will be with us, we'll feel it, but typically we'll still be able to go about our day-to-day -day lives. There may be some temporary changes in how we're thinking. We might notice ourselves speaking a bit more negatively, um, feeling a bit more uptight or whatever it may be, but, but those, that's not persistent. And usually when the stressor in the environment subsides, so too does the sadness. Remember what I said earlier, good mental health is not about feeling great all of the time. It is good to experience some sadness from time to time if the environment dictates that. Clinical depression, on the other hand, we will see the symptoms of depression, which we'll come on to in a second, present every day for a minimum of about two weeks. What we will also see is that the individual experiencing depression will no longer be taking pleasure or joy from life's day-to-day -day activities. So whereas with a bit of sadness, I may still have actually been building Lego with my children or whatever it may be, but actually in depression, I'm there, I'm not enjoying it. I feel disconnected when I'm there. I feel not present when I'm there. I may still be doing those things, but I'm not taking satisfaction or joy from them. There will be 
uh, sort of persistent and sustained changes to my thought processes and to my emotional state as well. And indeed with depression, we do find that even if they are brief and fleeting suicidal thoughts, those thoughts can come. Okay? Now there is a difference between brief and fleeting suicidal thoughts and sort of suicidal intent. But many people who experience depression, particularly for a long period of time, will start to question the point of life. And again, we go back to the slides earlier about men. If I've been feeling depressed for many, many, many months, and I can't see a way out of this depression, and I don't feel that I can share what it is I'm experiencing with my friends or family or spouse, it's very understandable that suicidal thoughts would come about. So this is the difference between sadness and depression. What are the symptoms? I'm not, again, going to read all of these verbatim. For a diagnosis of depression, we're usually looking at about five or six of these symptoms. Not everybody will tick the box for all of them. But the main ones to draw your attention to, you know, is the loss of interest or pleasure in activities and just this sort of lethargy or tiredness or feeling fatigue. Now, we have to be careful here because a lot of uh, physical health difficulties can explain some of those feelings of fatigue and tiredness, but taken together with things like feelings of worthlessness, uh, difficulties concentrating on making decisions, and just a general sense of feeling very sad or depressed, we may be looking at a diagnosis of depression. Here are some of the symptoms that we more commonly see in men, and I as a professional more commonly see in men. Self-medication. So when I'm feeling depressed, I turn to some of these addictive type behaviors as a way to medicate or to soothe those difficult feelings that I'm having. We may notice increased avoidance or isolation or withdrawal. So if you were a previous um, sort of gregarious and outgoing man and you've noticed in the last sort of year or two that you've gradually started to withdraw, this could be a symptom of depression. Now, again, we're not saying it is depression if you're not going out as much as you used to. But if you're noticing some of the other symptoms here, it may well be worth checking in with a profession. But I would say almost unequivocally, the symptom of depression that I see in men is being more irritable or angry or agitated, okay? Remember, we said earlier that men generally internalize the difficulties that they're experiencing. So if I am feeling, disconnected, cynical, hopeless, that that does something to my nervous system, which makes me more irritable uh, and angry. And indeed, if you've got a man in your life um, and you notice him being more irritable or short or uh, snappy even, again, alongside some of these other symptoms that could be. Clinical anxiety then. So I should say that Depression is the most commonly diagnosed mental health difficulty in men. Anxiety is less common, but it is um, still uh, a factor. And I would actually say from a um, from a social acceptance perspective, and there's no data on this, but and I'm just going on my many years of clinical experience here, but I think it's more socially acceptable for men to be depressed than it is for them to be anxious, okay? than it is for them to be a worrier. Um, that's that's my sense from the conversations that I've had over my many years of doing this. But it's more possible for men to come out and say, actually, I'm struggling with my mood. Things are getting me down rather than say, you know, I'm a chronic warrior uh, and I just feel really, really stressed. I don't know why that may be. Uh, and again, I've got no research to back that up. But these are some of the stories that that I've heard. So what is anxiety? We said earlier that at the root of depression is the emotion of sadness. In anxiety, the emotion is fear, okay? fear. Again, an adaptive human emotion. We would not be here today if we did not have the ability to experience fear and anxiety. So it's an adaptive human emotion. But again, it's gonna be triggered by something very specific, a deadline, an exam, a pitch to a client, whatever it may be, but it's temporary. Again, when the stressor abates, so does the anxiety. Clinical anxiety, on the other hand, a diagnosable mental health condition, sustained and persistent changes in terms of my thoughts, my feelings, and indeed my behaviors that I'm exhibiting as well. 
Suicidal thought was less common in anxiety compared with depression, but we do know that depression and anxiety can go hand in hand together. Okay? So many people experiencing depression uh, will, will also experience anxiety. Um, so many of you will know somebody with anxiety. We've just very briefly take a look at the signs and symptoms. Um, but there are varying degrees of anxiety, all the way from very mild to very sort of se severe and enduring. Those of you who have experienced anxiety, and again, all of you will have experienced anxiety, going back to the anecdotes I shared earlier, even the most level-headed of men will experience some fear from time to time. Okay? You may not see that fear, they may not openly express it, but it, but it will happen for sure. The physical symptoms of anxiety you can see here, the ones that we're most familiar with, uh, things like um, sort of palpitations in the chest or just this general feeling of restlessness. But I would say as well, for those of you new to anxiety, if you are experiencing gastro and intestinal uh, issues, digestive issues, this can often be a sign of longstanding anxiety. So really worth getting checked out. The psychological symptoms of anxiety excessive worry or fear. Okay. Now, we're very familiar with the uh, sort of anxious person who is talking endlessly and worrying out loud, but we're less familiar with the person who internalizes their anxiety. And actually what you start to see is somebody who might be more irritable or impatient, just appears on edge, but saying there's nothing, there's nothing wrong, I'm absolutely fine. Um, but again, in men who are anxious, we can often see this very sort of obsessive or compulsive type behavior, not necessarily obsessive compulsive disorder, but over planning, right? Desperate to get things ticked off in lists, okay? Um, you know, trying to mitigate all of the risks of things going wrong. And I, again, I see this a lot in very high functioning men, but where they are planning and planning and planning and planning, this can be a symptom of underlying anxiety and certainly something to look out for. So as we come then into the final section, let's just do a quick recap of where we've been today. We've looked at the global mental health statistics generally. We've taken a bit of a deeper dive into looking at men's mental health and why men's mental health is indeed a thing and why men's health outcomes when it comes to mental health may be poor. We've taken a bit of a deeper dive to look at mental health illness and anxiety and depression. And now we also want to just think about what can we do to safeguard mental health? This is focused on men, but all of the tools and ideas you see in front of you in a moment are also useful for women as well. So I've said numerous times today, the first thing we want to be doing is building our self-awareness, building our emotional intelligence to be able to ask ourselves the question, how am I doing before I can problem solve my mental health? I first need to understand how is my mental health right now? And if I've never done this introspective exercise, this is gonna feel really weird and strange. So, you know, maybe just do this yourselves. You don't have to be a man to do this, but just ask yourself, where is my mental health now? Am I healthy? Am I coping? Am I struggling? Or actually, am I unwell? So if I'm healthy, you know, I'm handling the ups and downs of life, okay? But I'm generally pretty engaged with work and my kids and whatever else it may be. My physical health is generally pretty good. I'm performing at work. I'm experiencing some of those more comfortable emotions, you know, um, and I, I have a sense of purpose and meaning. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, out of this world, but... I'm generally in a good place. And if I'm really honest with myself, actually I am in a, in a good place. Or am I just about coping? So I am functioning to the outside world, but I'm just getting by. Because inside, actually, I feel stuck or stressed or overwhelmed. Okay, this may be me just about coping, but I do need to take some reversible action. Or am I actually struggling? Am I emotionally reactive, irritable, snappy? Am I exhausted? Okay, and is that exhaustion starting to be seen by the outside world? Is my life being interrupted? Am I struggling to go to work on time? Am I struggling to see and engage with the people that I care about? 
am I engaging in some of those numbing behaviors? And again, I just want to make the point, this isn't just alcohol. Numbing behaviors can be things like excessive consumption of social media. Numbing behaviors can be throwing ourselves into Netflix. Okay? Numbing behaviors can be throwing ourselves into exercise as a way to not experience the mundane uh, or difficult emotions of day-to-day -day life. Or actually, am I unwell? Have there for a long period of time now be, been sustained and persistent changes in my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? Do I feel that I'm barely surviving? Am I having things like panic attacks or suicidal thoughts? If I am, I really need to be doing something about that. I would say, and I didn't make this point earlier, but I will now. If we're experiencing a diagnosable mental health condition, this is very unlikely to be something that has just suddenly, suddenly happened. Okay? Mental health difficulties can often take some time to treat. And conversely, they often take a long time to uh, sort of deteriorate. So the chances are I will have been feeling this way for quite some time. So if you are in a healthy and coping place, great. Maintain your mental hygiene, which we'll come on to in a second. But if you are struggling or if you are unwell, then you really do need to seek some professional support. Again, this can be if you're a man or if you're a woman. But I will meet a lot of men that will particularly, and I, I didn't go into much detail about this at the start, but I, I only, or I work fairly exclusively with people from the corporate world. And I would say that probably 90, 90% of my clinical caseload are in fact men. Um, and, you know, there is a hesitation or a reluctance to seek professional support. I will just keep going. I will just keep doing what I'm doing. It'll, you know, there's a there's a quieter period just around the corner. I've got a week's vacation coming up in a week or two. So I'm just going to wait. Things will get better. But actually, if we're experiencing depression and we have been for some time and we haven't been able to get on top of that ourselves and those feelings have persisted, it is time to reach out for some professional support. And that can be through a GP if it feels like coming to a psychiatrist or psychologist. If it feels like going to a GP would be a softer start, then please, please, please do do that. We here at the Lighthouse have a range of free of charge support groups as well. We have a support group specifically for men who are struggling with their mental health. Again, it is free of charge, completely free of charge, no hidden agendas or costs to it. But consider seeking professional support if you are struggling or indeed unwell. So what are the principles of good mental hygiene? And we've divided these into four parts. So firstly, do no harm, reduce what drains you. It is not optional, unfortunately, to reduce um, all draining people from our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, many of us will have relationships that take energy from us. But as much as possible, if we are struggling with our mental health or we're just not in a great space, just trying to minimize the interactions or the amount of time that we are spending uh, with people who generally drain us. There is some evidence that decluttering, so simplifying, whether it's our work diaries or our homes, there is some evidence that decluttering and just streamlining things uh, can be beneficial for our mental health. I would encourage you to utilize news and media in a conscious and deliberate way. I'm not saying switch off the news completely. I'm not saying, you know, delete all your social media apps. But what I'm saying is use social media and indeed all forms of media deliberately and consciously. This could be setting yourself a time limit. This could be saying right between the hours of, you know, I don't know, 5 p.m. and 5.30, that's when I check the news. Obviously, and I will name it with current events uh, in the region that are greatly impacting people. Um, many of us, our news consumption has indeed increased. And again, though, I would invite you to just be very conscious and deliberate about how much time uh, and from where you are getting that media as well. There is no rule of thumb as to what the right amount of time is, but as long as we are thinking and being conscious and deliberate about what is right for us, uh, that is a good idea. Many of us will be familiar with negative self-talk, this little voice that sits on our shoulder telling us that we're not working hard enough or that we need to do more or that we need to produce more or procreate more or be more powerful. This is generally what it says for men, okay? If that voice is very loud, 
we may consider doing some work on that, either through some self-help literature or indeed uh, with a professional. In terms of substances, things like smoking, uh, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, all of this stuff, these can help our emotions in the short time, okay? So if we have a cigarette or we have, you know, a cookie or something like that, ah, we get a, a temporary feeling of something very comfortable. But we know with all these substances in the longer term, actually they just um, uh, persist, okay? The difficulties that we experience, okay? So really do try and minimize uh, substances and be conscious and deliberate as much as possible. The uh, bucket you see here around self-soothing before solutions, often with men clinically, this is what we have to work on in the first instance. Because if we are a left brain man, as I said earlier, we have a problem, we want the solution and we want it pretty quickly. Right, before we search for the solution, we need to soothe the emotion. What does soothing mean? It means naming and noticing that I'm feeling a particular emotion. And I'm going to do something with that emotion. I'm going to ground myself. I'm going to, I don't know, expose myself to some cold water. I'm going to go outside for a quick walk. I'm going to feel the sunshine on my face. I'm just going to sit and breathe through that emotion. I'm going to squeeze my stress ball, whatever it may be. But I'm going to soothe that emotional experience. I'm not going to try and problem solve it straight away. I'm going to do something for my central nervous system that just helps to calm that emotion. I'm going to try and reduce the amount of stimulation or sensory input that I'm getting. Okay, so searching for soothing, not solutions. Solutions come, okay? We can sit down and figure out why it is that you might be feeling depressed or anxious, but firstly, let's learn how to soothe those emotions in the moment so that we don't have to turn to irritability or anger or substances as a way to cope. And again, for many men, these will be new tools. These will be new tools and techniques. So self-care, I'm not going to spend too much laboring uh, these points, but it wouldn't be a mental health webinar without mentioning the importance of sleep. And I mean that sincerely, that sounded sarcastic. But if you want to do one thing for your mental health, sleep is it. Okay, seven to eight hours of good quality sleep will reduce depressive symptoms by about 20%. Okay. So really trying to go to bed at the same time every night, have a nighttime routine, get up at as much as we can a consistent time the next day. Eating, drinking, nutrient-dense foods, moving for at least 5,000 steps, ideally 10,000, and turning inward through things like meditation, prayer experience. Fun, we underestimate the importance of fun. Now, of course, if we're depressed, we may be less in the mood uh, for socializing and laughing, and social connectedness, but the benefits uh, to our overall life and our mental health are well substantiated. And then connection. And again, it can be difficult. And what I will often say to men is, look, maybe it is that eight in every 10 people in your social circle may not be open to having a conversation about your mental health, right? Find those one or two that are and connect with those. And of course, consider seeing a mental health professional. Just very briefly then, before we take some questions, if you are working with a man or you have a man in your life, what can you do to support? Because this is the question that will often come. You know, I can see that somebody is struggling a bit, but I don't think they want help or I don't want to offend them or uh, I've made some suggestions, but actually they're, they're not taking up the offer. Things that you can say. Language does matter. Try not to say any of these harmful things, okay? You're going to shut down the conversation. You're going to drive disconnection, okay? You may also unintentionally cause harm. And this is the toxic positivity stuff I was referring to earlier. Many of us will say, look, just be strong, look on the bright side, it's not that bad. And that you could argue there may be a time and a place for that. But in my experience, men will just often feel shut down by this. Okay, because you're creating the impression for them that, you know, it's not a big deal. You don't need to worry about it. You just need to think a bit more positive. It shuts down the conversation. So what do we do instead? We ask open-ended questions. How have you been? What's this been like for you? I appreciate this isn't easy for you, but I appreciate you telling me about it. Is there anything that I can do to help? 
And what do you need from me right now? When people are struggling, often, and including men, they will just want to connect. Not necessarily always solutions first. You could even start the conversation with, look, what do you want from me right now? Do you just want to connect over this conversation or do you want me to find solutions and strategies with you? In my experience, men who have never opened up about this stuff may just want to connect. It will feel very unfamiliar for some men, okay? the idea of connecting, but some, they will want to. And as you are asking those questions, just inserting some hopeful and um, validating statements as well. I can't imagine what this has been like for you. You know, um, Thank you for opening up to me. I'm really pleased that you did. It was really good to connect with you. These are statements that you can find your own wording for. Bottom line is connection is key. Now you stand a better chance of being able to direct somebody onto professional support. You can sit with them in a vulnerable conversation where they genuinely connect. For those of you who have found today's talk useful and want to go more into how to support somebody who may be struggling with a mental health difficulty, you can find out more about our mental health first aid training program that we offer here at the Lighthouse Arabia. We won't train you to be therapists or counselors or doctors, but we will train you to have the uh, tools and skills to be able to identify and to have a very sensitive and empathic conversation with somebody who may be experiencing a mental health. Okay, very good. So we've got five minutes or so uh, just for some questions and answers, and I can see some questions have come here. So let me just stop sharing my screen. And uh, and we will go to the Q&A box. Um, okay. So a question here. Sometimes I feel torn between my work and family obligations and personal interests and hobbies. Okay. Um, it's also important to balance those two things. How do I do that? This is a great question. And uh, I think many men, I, well, actually not just men, I'm sure there are women watching today as well, but the men who are in the position of provider, protector, keep the ship afloat, this idea of engaging in self-care or hobbies or activities, we can often feel a sense of guilt as though we're being selfish, as though we're not spending our time wisely. And also if we have a partner or a system around us that has us in that role of protector and putting the family first and being an honorable family man, um, we will feel an incredible amount of guilt if we're engaging in those uh, hobbies, activities, whatever it may be. My strong advice to you would be engage in things that make you a better version of yourself. And if that is a 30 minute run in the morning, if that is you know, going to the cryo chambers, if that is, you know, a round of golf with your friends at the weekend, if that is reading a book by the pool for 45 minutes, that is going to make you a better version of yourself. Then you need to find ways to do that. And I want to give you permission to do that. And I would say that any sort of reasonable partner or spouse should be able to hear that argument as well. It is, it is fundamental. Um, now we, it's often the cliche that self-care is not selfless or not selfish. Uh, sorry, it is actually a very selfless act. Obviously, we need to think about when and trying to plan that at times that doesn't interrupt or impact those around us uh, to such a great extent. But um, I would like to give you permission to build that into your day because I think it is super important. It's not easy. And as somebody myself has at times struggled with the guilt of uh, building in self-care, I can really resonate with it. But um, I, th I think you will notice uh, the returns on your investment if you are able to. Thank you for that question. Um, a question here, is excessive spending considered a numbing behavior? Good question. I think uh, the short answer is yes. Um, if we think about what excessive spending, and presumably we're thinking about spending online or going to the mall and um, uh, and those kind of things, um, yes, it is. If we are engaging in that behaviour as a way to get some relief from uncomfortable emotions, or we are chasing a comfortable emotion, we could see it 
as a numbing type behavior. So if we're feeling sad or lonely or depressed or down, if we can go to the mall and you know spend a good amount of money, we come out of there feeling really high. But we will then typically notice that will be followed by guilt. I've spent too much. I shouldn't have done that. Um, then yes, I would say excessive spending is very much normalized in our society and actually sometimes glamorized as well. So people don't always identify it as a significant problem. Um, but I would say if you're noticing this as a pattern uh, in yourself, then it is well worth checking in with a profession. Okay, just to, and again, it might not be, you know, clinical mental health difficulty, but it is worth uh, worth getting independently checked out with a profession. Okay. Um, so one final question just before we do finish up today. Um, this is a great question. Where's the line between resilience and admitting having a mental health difficulty? This is something I hear a lot. And I think it is really important that if we are saying we have a mental health or we're struggling in terms of our mental health, we still we still do want to have what I would call a sort of action orientated approach to that. Because sometimes if we are struggling with our mental health and it's really getting us down, we can go into a pattern of behavior which uh, where we're talking incessantly about how much we're struggling and this is really difficult, it's been difficult for so long, why does nobody understand? Um, and we can find ourselves sort of getting pulled in uh, to the mental health difficulty. Um, without taking any action. Okay, now, it can be very, very difficult to take action when we're experiencing a mental health difficulty. And sometimes, you know, for a week or two or three or four, we do just need to sit and be sad and grieve and strip back our lives. Okay? But we do then also need to be thinking about what next. Okay, what do I need from myself? What do I need from other people to help me out of this? So I would say resilience is not necessarily about, right, something bad's happened, let's jump into problem solving. Resilience is what do I need from myself right now? And what actions or steps can I take to help me moving forward? Um, I would, of course, say seek some professional support. Don't do this on your own. Get an independent practitioner to support you through this journey. Um, there are useful mindsets and approaches and tools that we can use if we are struggling. Um, and to be coached through those by a professional is, um, is, is what I would say. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure being here with all of you today. I hope that you found uh, this webinar useful. I apologize, I couldn't get to... Uh, the the many 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 questions that are that are written here, but we do of course do these community webinars uh, on more than a monthly basis. So please do join uh, for the next series. If you've got uh, questions here, you can also send these into uh, the Lighthouse social media or accounts. If you've got some questions, uh, we can take them over there on the social media accounts. Okay, thank you for being here. Wishing you a very 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 pleasant day ahead and take care. Bye bye.